I would like to talk to you today about how to obtain real power. All right. I've outlined seven different things here, um, and this applies to both saved and lost people. Uh, if you want to get power, if you want to have power over other people, the number one way most people would think is money. Money will buy you power. Fighting strength. We'll get back into that here in a little bit. Number three, wisdom. Number four, physical attraction. Number five, connections. It's who you know. Have you heard, ever heard of that? Number six, technology. And number seven, the most important of them, is spiritual. All right. So we're going to get into this here. We're going to be looking at these seven points here, doing kind of a detailed study. I'm going to be showing you from the Bible um, what the Bible says about these different points too. But uh, real power. What is real power? Well, uh, fame and fortune. Well, not necessarily. There's some very powerful people, and they're not famous. You don't even know who their names are. Um, fortune. Well, you know, most people have that are in powerful positions do have money. And most of these things here can get you money right there. Kind of an interesting thing. But money, in and of itself, does not mean that you're powerful. There are a lot of people who have a lot of uh, things with their name attached to it, but they're actually liabilities. There are a lot of people in this country, uh, especially nowadays, uh, there's a whole lot of people that have multi-millions of dollars worth of property, shall we say, but they're, it's all owed to the bank. That's not really money. It's not really wealth. It's artificial wealth. Um, you know, this whole thing of creating wealth through debt, it's not really truly powerful. You're just using the banking scam to make yourself look wealthy. Again, uh, if you broke down everybody and said, okay, there's no more debt, uh, pay your debts, uh, you would see very quickly that a lot of seemingly wealthy people are actually very poor. And um, there's a lot of people that have their money in the stock market and whatever else, and they might look like they have a lot of money, but it can all be wiped out just like that. And it's what happened in the first Great Depression, and I believe what's coming very soon here in the future. Again, a lot of people, they've, they've invested, put their money in all sorts of different things, um, and that later turns out to be a bad investment. I'll give you a good example is housing. If you purchased a house in the last two years, you're going to see that your house is going to be devalued when the housing market corrects, coming very soon. A lot of people say, well, the, the media is saying, and some realtors are saying that the housing market is just going to keep going up. But when you get into the thing of debt to wealth ratios and, and or debt to uh, like what you earn and what the cost of housing is, it's really far apart right now, not to be compared to the past. Um, the cost of housing is absolutely insane and you get into some of the scheming that was done with Zillow back in the 2020 here in America, um, inflating the housing market, the Federal Reserve buying $9 trillion worth of assets, physical assets. What, the, what I mean, what is the Federal Reserve? You know, it's a private run for profit corporation. It's not a bank and they don't, it's not federal and it doesn't have reserves, gold reserves and silver reserves. It was designed to come in and steal the people's money from them and, that's, and get them in debt. That's exactly what they've done. So again, oh, the Federal Reserve, is they create money. Yeah, they create that out of thin air. Oh, no, it has to be backed by gold and silver. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, there's $30 trillion. America is $30 trillion plus in debt right now. I don't think that's all backed up by gold. Okay. Well, you know, the, the value of gold, going to, the inflation thing and all this. I can't help you if you're deceived in thinking that the economy is really good right now. You're... <laughs> that's a real problem but the issue of money um, what's true money gold and silver if you get into the Bible you go through the scriptures gold and silver is always given as true currency um, the problem today is we have digital currencies and of course paper currencies that are, can be printed and whatever else and they can devalue gold and silver make it look like it's not actually worth anything and yet all the countries and all the elite people and everything else out there, they still lust after gold and silver. Kind of an interesting thing. And when we get up to heaven, the streets are like gold. The Bible says like transparent gold. I don't know how that works. Uh, I haven't been there yet, but I'll be going someday. Um, pretty amazing. So money, 
Let's look at the scriptures, see what the Bible has to say. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, written by the wealthiest men in terms of physical wealth, real wealth, uh, I believe that ever lived. I mean, you look at the amount of physical gold that King Solomon was making in a year, 666 talents of gold, interesting number. Um, that's a lot of physical gold. And of course, he had a lot more than just gold and silver too, by the way. He had precious stones and he had men servants, maid servants. He had all kinds of livestock. He had lands. He had all kinds of things. There's a lot of things that can give you power and make you a very powerful person. And it's not all just dollar bills. And there's a lot of people too, by the way, that have a lot of this right now. And they're scared to death because they know it can be devalued. They know it can be taken from them. Ecclesiastes chapter... Chapter 10, verse 19. A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. That's what most people think of. Money answers all things. Um, hey, I'm getting, going to get in trouble with the law. Let me see if I can pay off the right people. There's some power there. Um, hey, don't bother so-and-so because he owns this town. He owns this whole area. And you go after him, and you're going to pay for it. See, money does bring power. Let's just be honest about it. Well, you know, you can argue against it. Sure, you can. But the reality of it is, it's just one of those facts. Uh, even if you're an atheist and you say, I, I don't believe the Bible or whatever else, the Bible says money answereth all things. Scientific statement there. Money answers all things. Uh, why haven't the politicians come out against Big Pharma? Because Big Pharma has them in their back pocket. They finance them. They fund them. You watch television. Uh, it's big pharma. Try Prilosex, you know, or something. Some kind of drug names or whatever else. Which drug names, by the way, are just oftentimes the chemical names. They just kind of take little bits of the chemicals that are in the drug and put it all together and make it into the pharmaceutical name. <laughs> little inside joke that they do on you. Here are the different parts of the chemical, toxic chemicals that we put together to make this pill and we just make it into the name. Pretty incredible. Now let's go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. And there's a whole lot of scriptures we could go over, but I'm going to keep this study fairly short. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. The Bible has a lot to say about money and it's not all negative, by the way. There are some very wealthy men in the Bible. There are ways that you can be wealthy and spend it the right way, and you can be powerful. Abraham was a very powerful man, a very righteous man. King David was a very powerful, very righteous man, and they both were very wealthy, very rich, had a lot of money. But uh, here's the danger. 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 6, written to a New Testament Christian. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. If you get reduced down to the point of having food in your stomach and clothes on your back, you can be content with that. Hmm. You say, how on earth would that work? If I lose everything, how would it work? Well, that depends on if you have any other kind of uh, power. See? See? If, you, if all the power that you have is all right here and you don't have this or this or this or this or this especially, then yeah, that's a bad situation to get into. But you can have other levels of power in here and um, you'll survive and do pretty good. Verse 9, but they that will be rich... Not that are rich, but will be rich. They have money. I want to be a millionaire. I want to be a billionaire. I want all this money. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. So a man of God 
it's okay to have some money. Obviously, you have to have money, right? You have to have money to pay bills. You have to have money to buy things, to buy these books here, these Bibles, um, electricity for the camera and whatever else. I have to have money. But, but thou, a man of God, flee these things. The yachts and the vacation homes and the tropics and, and the private jets and the you know, Rolls Royces and the Rolex watches. and whatever. Flee those things. And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. This is more important, in other words, than that. Hmm. And we're going to see as we go through all these different things, the most powerful one on the list is the spiritual. If you have a connection to God, you can outdo all this other stuff. Now let's look at fighting strength. And I wrote fighting strength here for a reason. You can see I could say um, power uh, it's in terms of military power. Well, yeah, that's there. But then you have somebody that might not have a military, but they're very good at some kind of martial arts or you know, fighter or something like that. Well, he's not a military, but he's very strong. And then you can have some guy, some, he goes out on the street and some guy walks up to him, it's 90 pounds, but he has a gun and shoots him. And all of his fighting training doesn't mean anything. So I can't say weapons, I can't say military, I can't say, you know, whatever. So I just thought, well, fighting strength. Because again, physical strength, that doesn't mean anything. If you have somebody who's small and they can have a gun and somebody's big, it's physically stronger. Fighting strength, <laughs> it's a way to have power. Um, you can wield power out of the barrel of a gun. One person with a gun control can control 10 people without a gun, you know, that are, that are unarmed. Um, and there's lots of other things. You can use a sword, you can use a hammer, you can use all kinds of different improvised weapons. There's strength, there's power, in other words, in fighting strength. Let's look about that. Go to Luke chapter 14. The book of Luke. Luke chapter 14, verse 31. Jesus is speaking here, talking about some things. He says, Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Do, do I have enough fighting strength to be able to take on my enemies? Hey, there's some guy over there and I want to rob him. But he's bigger than me. Hmm. Oh, there's a, there's a group of people over here I'd like to go over and pick a fight, but there's four of them and one of me. Whatever. You have to consider those things. Do you have enough fighting strength? Do you have enough power? Uh, let's look at uh, Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. This is a future event here. Revelation 13 verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. If you're going to kill, if you're going to go out in the military and fight and whatever else and, and war, there's a good chance you're going to die in that war. If you're going out and you're living by the gun or living by the sword, you might end up being killed by that. All right Now this is a future thing out in, in, into the time of Jacob's trouble. And you have basically the saints that are going out there. They're not part of the Antichrist system. And the Bible says there um, in verse 7, Revelation 13, verse 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. What was given to him? Power. And how did the Antichrist obtain that power? Well, you read in the early part of the passage there, the devil, the dragon, gives him his power and seat and great authority. He's given fighting strength. He has a crown and he goes out conquering and to conquer. Hmm. So there's power there. There's fighting strength. 
And uh, if you're going to live that way, if you're going to say, I want to obtain my power through being the best mixed martial arts guy or the best uh, boxer, wrestler, whatever, I'm going to be a powerful guy like that. Well, you're eventually going to meet somebody that's going to beat you up. And uh, I'll just kind of skip ahead here a little bit. But uh, number two and number four go away with time. Uh, So-and-so is a great fighter. You see Muhammad Ali, you know, and, and he's, uh, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest, you know, when he's younger. And he was a good fighter. But uh, what was he when he got older? Parkinson's disease? He was shaking his head and things, and you know, little old man in a wheelchair. What happened to your fighting strength? It's gone. A lot of men like that. I remember seeing a little old man the one time walking along. Tattoos, you could see, just barely even see what they were on his arms. And his little old guy, and he's walking, just barely shuffling his feet down along the side of the road. And I thought, I wonder what that guy was. Probably a soldier or something back in his day. World War II veteran, probably. Now look at him. Barely even walk down the road. He had some fighting strength at one point in time, but uh, it went away. He didn't have power anymore, you see. But um, what will be the thing that protects those saints in the time of Jacob's trouble from the Antichrist when the Antichrist goes out to make war and to overcome them? Um, will there be any that survive? Yeah, there will be. Uh, I believe that there will be some that endure to the end of that time of Jacob's trouble. But what's going to protect them? Money? No, the whole world is on the mark of the beast system, the central bank digital currency that turns into the whole you know, thing there that's coming. Um, digital money that your account can be wiped out and whatever else. You can't buy or sell unless you have that mark. So they won't have money. They won't have fighting strength. They'll be limited uh, fighting against the Antichrist army. Not much chance there. The only thing that they're going to have really is the spiritual at that point in time. They'll, they won't have, you know, they'll have some wisdom, I guess, if you get it from God. Physical attraction, probably not, you know, <laughs> running from the Antichrist army, you're probably not going to be caring about your physical appearance very much. Connections, definitely no connections. Technology, they won't have technology in the time of Jacob's trouble. All they'll have is the spiritual. Again, money is not as important as spiritual. Fighting strength is not as important as the spiritual. Better get your uh, life right with God and uh, be concerned about righteousness and holiness and things like that. Next, let's talk about wisdom. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Go back there. Back to the Old Testament again, to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 16 through 18. Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. Wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. The words of wise men are heard and quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. Hmm. But one sinner destroyeth much good. Is wisdom better than weapons of war? Is wisdom better than strength? Absolutely. Yeah, if you have some smarts up here, you can, you can avoid fights. You can avoid doing the wrong things. There are different ways that you can wage warfare on a country without open physical confrontation. There's a lot of things that you can do, psychological warfare operations and things like that. Wisdom is oftentimes better than fighting strength. Hey, let's move in. Let's, let's nuke this city. Let's use depleted uranium. Let's do all this other stuff. Well, that, you know, that kills our own soldiers. Yeah, you know, hmm. And if we destroy the infrastructure there, then what are we really taking from the enemy? You know, sometimes it's better to fight with this than it is with this. Yeah. Go to Psalm 111. Psalm 111. And uh, verse 10. The fear of the Lord... Spiritual. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Uh, oh, I don't need to follow that old book, that old Bible. Just keep that thing away from me. That just Don't be a Bible basher. Don't be a Bible thumper and all this stuff. I don't need to follow the Bible. Why not? Do you know if you follow the commandments of God that are written in this book, you'll live a very happy, healthy life? His commandments are not grievous. The Bible talks about they're wonderful. It's a good thing. Abstain from this. Stay away from drunkenness. Well, I'd rather have drunkenness. I like cirrhosis of the liver. You know, it's wonderful and everything. Uh, hey, avoid flee fornication. He that, you know, commits fornication sins against his own body, you know, his own flesh. Well, I don't know. I, I like sexually tra transmitted diseases and things. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> huh? All these people to fight against this book. It's just, why? And I've seen this thing. So it's always cracked me up about atheists. They'll come up with all this stuff of, I don't need the Bible and whatever else. Uh, I don't need religion. You know, by religion, they, you know, I don't need organized religion either. But that's not what they mean. They just mean belief in Jesus Christ. I don't need that stuff and whatever. And you say, okay, what are you doing with your life? Well, I don't do this and I don't do that. And they, they basically come up, if they have any good standards, it goes back to the Bible. And I think, you know, if you would just stick by the Bible and reject organized religion, you wouldn't have to be an atheist. You know, there's nothing really in this book that should be an insult to anybody that has some wisdom to them. Okay? Um, you just fear God. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You want wisdom, it goes back to the spiritual Well, I'm going to have a different type of spiritual. You know, I'll just get into Buddhism or Satanism or some other kind of thing, Islam or whatever else, Catholicism, worship of Mary. Um, no, those things don't line up with the scriptures. When I'm talking about spiritual, I'm talking about lining up with this King James Bible, greatest book of all time. Now let's look at physical attraction, the book of Proverbs. Mostly when you talk about physical attraction, you talk about a fair woman, a beautiful woman. Um, there are some men that are attractive and they are able, to, are able to get their way and they can work at whatever else and things people tend to you know, think more highly of the tall, dark, and handsome type of guy. Um, but usually people think of, wisdom, or of women. So that's what we're, we're going to look at here. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Reproofs of instruction. Okay. To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart. Physical attraction. Uh, verse 25. Neither let her take thee with her eyelids fluttering her eyes, you know, and things blinking at you. For by means of a horse woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Uh, yeah. The adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Again, it's so interesting. I've seen women that in their youth, oh boy, they were beautiful. They're really pretty, and they definitely worked their way up the ladder and, and uh, were very successful and married the right guy. They were trophy wife and, and things like that. And they get older and they start showing that they're getting older and all of a sudden the men don't want them anymore. And instead of having actual good husband and children that loved her and everything else, she just used her beauty and then tried to hold on to it, you know, later on in life and it failed. And then she's the adulteress at that point in time. She's been through so many marriage marriages, you know. I mean, Elizabeth Taylor, I think her name was or whatever, good example of that. Zsa Zsa Gabor and some of these other Hollywood harlots. And they get to the end of their life and they've been through four, five, six marriages. And then they're hunting for the precious life. They're like the Bible talks about. <laughs> that was stupid. Their power that they sought after, they said, hey, I can, you know, I have a mirror. And uh, mirror, mirror on the wall, who is fairest of them all? Well, you were until you got usurped by Cin uh, Cinderella or whatever. <laughs> um, not Cinderella, what was the story there? Snow White or whatever. And the seven little devils or something. But uh, 
They had power for a while, didn't they? But uh, she should have had this kind of power. Let me show you. Proverbs 31. Proverbs chapter 31. Verse 30. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. A woman that feareth the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of uh, wisdom. Wisdom is better than strength, than weapons of war. Huh. Yeah. So, the physically attractive woman, if she's smart, she'll say, my beauty is vain. I'm young and attractive now and whatever else, but uh, it's not always going to be that way. So instead of trying to use my beauty to become famous and get some power, I think I'm going to learn to fear God and have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Get married, have children, enjoy myself like that. That's the smart thing to do. Next, let's uh, look at connections. It's who you know. Luke chapter 16. In order to be a Mason, you have to know a Mason. Yeah. Come down, join the lodge. Come join the fraternity. Be part of this great work and everything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. And he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man, right there, which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg, I am ashamed. Uh, a lot of rich people get themselves into that. I cannot dig. I can't go out and work manual labor. And uh, to beg, I'm ashamed. I'd be ashamed to be homeless. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto me, unto my Lord? Excuse me. And he said, An hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and write fourscore. And the Lord commanded the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. It's kind of a kick to save people there. And I say unto you, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail... They may receive you into everlasting habitations. Uh, it's an interesting passage of scripture there. What it's saying is, if you're going to be a businessman, essentially, um, make some connections there. Have some people that owe you. Hey, I'm going to do, do this uh, favor for you, and um, we'll just let it go for now. But when I need some help, I'm coming back, and I'm going to ask you for that favor. Hey, you remember when I did this thing here? How much do you owe my master again, by the way? Well, hey, um, we'll just kind of write this off, and then I'm going to need a little favor there. You need to take me in, or whatever. That's what's going on in the passage there. But there's a lot of people that make good connections. They have the right to, uh, you know, you can get into the fraternal stuff, I realize. The Catholic secret societies like the knighthoods, Knights of Malta, Knights of the Equestrian Order, Knights of uh, Columbus, whatever. And then you can get into the quote-unquote Protestant the Protestant Catholic knighthoods like Freemasonry and, you know, the Rotaries and the Lions and Club and all that other stuff, uh, the auxiliary things, the Elks Lodge and, and whatever, you can get into those quote-unquote Protestant, you know, truly Catholic, uh, that's all that they are, um, fraternal things. And then you can get into the college fraternities and sororities and whatever else to get the right connections. But it also works with, excuse me, with businesses. Yeah, I go to this sawmill down here and they, I get to know the guys really good that work there and they get me good deals on this lumber and whatever when I go in there. I used to do that. And it wasn't some kind of a evil, sinful thing or something, some you know secret meetings where we all had to wear black robes or something. No, it just was 
you know, I came down there and to some, one of the sawmills I used to go to when I lived in Pennsylvania when I was a professional wood turner, and they knew what I did for a living, and they knew that, you know, they would keep the really special wood for me, and said, hey, look at this, here's a piece we just got in, you might want this, and whatever, and yeah, and they gave me some really good deals sometimes. Um, it's a great thing. I developed some connections, you see. So that's a good way to get some power, in other words. Ephesians chapter 5, but there's a problem. You know, there would be, because you see the spiritual is what it's all about. So if you could just say, well, I'll make friends to myself of the mammon of unrighteousness. I'll join the Freemasons. I'll join the, this fraternal order or that thing or whatever else, because then I'll be safe. Um, I think a lot of people during the whole pandemic that were part of secret societies and things realized all of a sudden, um, you know, my connections aren't really helping me right now. <laughs> um, we're all being locked down. We're all going through this stuff. I guess my power and everything else that I thought I had because of my connections uh, didn't work. See these, you know, videos and things, these people, you know, people in government, state government, and they, they're speeding and they get pulled over and the officer says, oh, you were going too fast. Don't you know who I am? You know, <laughs> uh, you were speeding. It doesn't matter who you are. Uh, you've been caught. Oh, I can have your job, police officer. Uh, well, you disobeyed the law. So whether or not you fire me or get me fired is irrelevant. You were going too fast. You were doing, you know, 45 in a 25 mile an hour zone. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to give you a ticket. Well, we'll just say about that. You know, they think that their connections can get them out of it. And they find out very quickly that no, your connections cannot get you out of it. And a lot of times those people end up getting fired. Ephesians chapter 5, um, verse 11 through 13. Here's the bad thing about the connections uh, thing. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Hmm. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. It's funny because, you know, in Freemasonry they desire, what's the thing you desire most? Light. <laughs> well, the, uh, uh, what, they're, what the light is that they're looking for is the light of Lucifer. Not the light of the Bible, not the light of Scripture the light of Jesus Christ. They want the light of Lucifer. Kind of an interesting thing there. But uh, we're not supposed to be doing things in secret and having little secret meetings and secret little handshakes and, you know, uh, <clears throat> just here today, you know. <laughs> Somebody's going to take a screenshot of that and put it out there. Denlinger's a mason or something now. <sighs> Whatever. But again, hey, I have my connections. I got to know the guys down at the lodge. They're now behind me and they're doing this and they're they're giving me some money and, and whatever else. There's a lot of good, you know, a lot of these big name preachers, by the way. I think Jack Hiles being one of them. Um, very clearly, he was being funded by Freemasons. Uh, his, you know, they made this, you know, monument to Jack Hiles, and it's a, it's the obelisk. You know, I have it in my video exposing Jack Hiles. Clearly, Masonic type of a thing. Uh, Sam Jones was a Freemason. Billy Sunday was a Freemason being funded by John D. Rockefeller, senior. You know, these guys are being funded by the Freemasons. What are they doing? They're having fellowship with darkness. The things that are done of those people in secret. What would they have been better off doing? Forget the connections here. You want a connection there. With the spiritual, with Jesus Christ. That's where the connection is that matters. Not, well, you know, I'll just kind of get the right, you know, connections around it. That won't help you. Now let's look at technology. Technology, Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11. We'll see an example here of a future technology. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished, talking about the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, that's who they are. There's no debate on that. It's not Enoch and Elijah. Sorry about that. It's not. Um, I've proved that in other studies. Uh, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of, that, of the great city, 
which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindred, kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and in half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and in half the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. How can the whole world see two men that are laying there dead in the streets of Jerusalem? You go back to 1611 when the King James Bible was finished. The translation work was done. Um, how would that have made any sense? They would have had to try to spiritualize that and thinking to themselves, okay, that can't be actually that all the world can, you know, everybody's seeing them laying in the streets of Jerusalem. That doesn't make any sense. It must mean, uh, you know, probably the brilliant, you know, men of back then were probably really scratching their heads over that one. But today... Well, that's no problem. Live report from Jerusalem? Pfft, that's nothing. We know about that. It happens all the time. Other foreign countries and things, and oh, here's live from the streets of Kiev, Ukraine, or something. Or here's live from the streets of, you know, London or something. You know, happens a lot. Uh, is that technology going to be used for power? Mm-hmm. The Antichrist kingdom is going to be so successful because of technology. You know, and I'll just say this, in terms of technology, we think in, in the realm of high technology that we have today. But technology has always existed. You have one guy, and he's out there doing his field with a hoe. You know, and some farmer his ne next door says, uh, you know, I could hoe the rows, you know, and get my plants, you know, or get my crops planted uh, I could do it that way, but what would happen if I took a, the hoe off of the handle and I attached it to this thing, and I wonder if I could pull that behind my horse? Yeah, and he does it, and he's, oh, I got the whole row done in, you know, a minute. Turn and do the other one, and do the other one. And within a half hour, his whole field's ready to be planted, and the guy over there is still doing it by hand. Well, what is it? One guy has more technology than the other guy. One farmer has a higher technology. Uh, it's you know, technology has always been there, and it gives you more power over your opponents in business. You know, the Egyptian people. I think they were better prepared for famine, not just because the Lord had prophesied through. You know, he put the dream into jo into Pharaoh's mind, and Joseph comes and tells him what's going to happen. The seven years of fam or. Uh, plenty and then the seven years of famine that was there the vision was there but egypt ancient egypt was a very technological um group of or a very technological civilization say it that way they had a lot of very amazing technology stuff that we don't even have today uh the greatest engineers couldn't build the pyramids today we don't have the cranes for it and the power for it and whatever else uh, and, you know, where the stones come from. I mean, you go into all the different things of the mysteries of how they were building these pyramids. It's, it's incredible, you know, building them with hand tools. I mean, you go back even into the 1700s and you look at some woodworking examples that they had, the, the cabinetry and things that they would build and the homes that they would build in the 1700s just blows the doors off of anything today. So, the oh, well, you know, we have uh, all of our high-tech laser CNC machinery and all that. Uh, it's there's some good stuff to that there's definitely some uh, precision that you can do and whatever but a lot of times you look at the past they were doing things greater than what we have now so don't again don't think technology is all just smartphones and you know uh, implantable chips in the brain and you know Tesla cars or something like that no some of that stuff is actually you know there's some real problems with it, some real bugs in the system, if you will, and real problems going forward in terms of having the supplies to build those things and keeping them running smoothly and all this artificial intelligence stuff and whatever else. There's some major problems with that. I'm not a fan of artificial intelligence. So, technology there. Uh, can it give you power? Yeah, it can, but you have to watch out for that. Revelation chapter 13, verse 15 through 18 
and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, technology, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Is there technology there? Yes. Is it powerful? Yes. Are we seeing the uh, great-grandfather, so to speak, or perhaps even grandfather uh, systems coming in where you can't buy or sell unless you have the mark? Yes, we are seeing it right now. This, even with the pandemic thing, you know, you have a, you need a special pass and whatever and things or you can't buy or sell. There are certain stores you can't go into. They're starting to limit what you are able to purchase based on what your decisions in life are. I have religious objection. Okay, you can't come in here. I have just a rational, logical objection. Sorry, can't come in here. Can't buy or sell. We're already seeing the foundation for what's going to come in the future. And then you get into the thing of, oh, we're, we have uh, cybersecurity issues, and so we need to make people more safe, you know, with uh, digital IDs. And, um, you know, and we can't uh, trust, you know, there, there are terrorists out there and drug dealers and things, and, you know, they're dealing in cash. So we need to have central bank digital currencies to make sure that you're safe. You know, um, hey, we don't agree with the purchase that you made there because it was from another country and our computer system, our artificial intelligence picked up on it. So uh, we're shutting your card down and you have to call us and tell us what you did with your money in order for us to release the funds of your bank account. It's happened to me a couple times now. My wife says, hey, there's something over in whatever country on Etsy that she wants to purchase and she buys it. And I, you know, all of a sudden, you know, bling, this is, you know, your bank calling a fraud detection alert. You know, please call us at your earliest convenience. And you have to, you know, go through all these different transactions and, you know, bend down and touch your toes three times and stand up and touch your nose and rub your head at the same time. You know, it's ridiculous. Uh, people in the past would have never put up with this. But now, well, we don't have a choice. Everything's going digital and, you know, I get my money from a piece of plastic. What happened to gold and silver? We went from gold and silver to paper to now a little plastic thing. Now, to you know, that's going to be eliminated eventually. Just, you know, swipe your phone or your hand or whatever. There you go. Um, beep, you know. It's insane. So the technology is there and it is going to lead to a lot of power. But how do you fight that? Spiritual. So let's look at the last one here. Spiritual. What's the real power all about? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10. This is the encouraging one for you if you're born again. Because you have a power that is in you that is better than this whole entire list. The first six here are nothing compared to number seven, if you're truly born again. And if you're living righteously, I might add too. Um, you can be a partaker with the lost world if you mess around with things and get off the, the mark, so to speak, um, in terms of the mark being you know, what you're supposed to do according to Scripture. I'm using as an expression. <laughs> I, have to, I have to clarify because my enemies like to pick up my words here. Um, Dunlinger said you're supposed to take a mark. I didn't say that, you know. I just meant the thing that you're supposed to do according to the Word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse, uh, we'll start in verse 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Um, how often do you do that? How often do you fight your thoughts? How often do you stop singing that song of the world? Say, stop that. How often do you start lusting in your mind? Start to think impure thoughts and you fight it. 
Um, brethren, verse 5 there, casting down imaginations. Throw it down. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. I want to know about God. God, what do you want me to do today? Lord, what is your will for this day? What am I supposed to do? And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The obedience of Christ? Oh, no, no. You know, we just, we say a prayer. You believe. You don't even have to say a prayer according to some of these Gnostic devils out there. You believe. I believe what the Bible says about Jesus dying on the cross. I believe, therefore I receive. I am now saved because I have declared myself to be saved because of my own belief. So now I can go out and I can live however I want to live. Then how does obedience to Christ come in? There doesn't have to be any changed life. There's no changed life required. Really? To the obedience of Christ? Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ? Every action to the obedience of Christ. You know, I just don't want to go out and go to strip clubs or bars or go to the guy dealing meth on the corners. No, your thoughts. You talk about strict. You're not to think impure thoughts. You're not to have thought, wicked music going on through your mind. Bring them into captivity. You think I'm strict? You think what? Some of these people. Oh, Denlinger's backloading work salvation. He's a lordship salvation. He's a this, he's a that. What do you do with a verse like that? You're to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Your thought life isn't even supposed to be bad, much less what you do physically. It's incredible. You say, what? So I have to do all that stuff? Oh, man, that just seems so bad and everything else. So what do I get as, as a result of bringing all my thoughts into captivity? Oh, I don't know. Spiritual power? Answers to prayer? If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Do you regard iniquity? A lot of people go to church, you know, they go out there to church and they're, oh, God bless you, brother, oh, hello, and everything else. And their thoughts are wicked. I've seen it. I've been in the church, but it's a good night. I've preached in the pulpits and everything else. And I've seen, you know, and I get people, people are get. there's so much confusion about what I teach and preach. Let me clarify again. I am not against Christians meeting together. That's fine. Okay. What I'm against is the Catholic Church church type of uh, counterfeit. Oh, we're Protestant. We're reforming the Catholic church. You know, we go when we have our Sunday best and we have the altar up front and we have all this stuff that's nowhere in scripture. That's what I'm against. A bunch of people saying, hey, we have, we have a barn on our property. You guys want to come over and we'll worship the Lord together on a Sunday or a Tuesday night or whenever we can get together? Fine. Wonderful. Have at it. Have a great time. Wonderful. <laughs> that's not what I'm against. I'm against the thing of Sunday morning, 9 to 12, Sunday evening, you know, and, and Wednesday and prayer meeting and the, all that stuff. And you go there and there's all kinds of problems in those places. That's what I'm against. But I can't tell you how many times I have looked and I've seen men looking and lusting after women in the church buildings. Can't tell you how many times I've seen it, especially the modern ones. Good night. I remember there was a, a modern church I went to the one time Methodist church. This is years ago. I'm talking probably um, in the 1990s. And uh, my parents were going there and I went to visit. And there was a girl. Every time that they st said stand up to sing such and hymn such and such or whatever else, she'd get up and she'd have to pull her mini skirt down enough that her underpants weren't showing. I'm not joking. And every guy in the whole church, you could see all the heads going like this, looking over. And every time she'd stand up, she'd get up and she'd, you know, pull her skirt back down, you know. Yeah, and sing the hymn, you know, tonight. Mm -hmm, yeah. Are they all bringing their thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ? I don't think so. I don't think so. And what, what, uh, what did it lead to? Oh, not a whole lot of spiritual power at that place. Mostly lost people going there, doing the little church thing, you know. I go to church on Sunday, and the rest of the day I get to live like the devil. Uh huh. No power. People going in there and they're using new versions that come from the Catholic Church. They don't use the King James Bible. No power. 
Well, we do use the King James Bible here. We just, uh, it's not perfect. It's just a translation. It could be, it's not, you know, inspired. It's not this, it's not that. No power. No power. Well, uh, you know, we want to live a little bit like the world. We like to live, look like the world and act like the world a little bit. You know, okay, I'll watch TV, you know, okay, I just for Fox News and sports and, and, you know, some other things. You bring in your thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You really want spiritual power? Then it's going to cost something. You know, that's the funny thing about everything on this list. It all requires work. Every single bit of it. I didn't say you have to work to be saved, by the way. You liars out there, you filthy bunch of stupid liars. I, I've dealt with this stuff for years. You don't have to work to be saved, but you have to work to have spiritual power. You see. I mean, what do you think? It's action. You know, get into the verbs and the all the other stuff there. You know, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's action. It's not passive. You don't just sit there and go, oh, the Lord's going to just clean up my thought life for me. No, it requires you to do it. You have to work if you want to have money. You have to train if you want to have fighting strength. You have to study. Study. Read books if you want wisdom. You have to work out and whatever else if you want physical attraction. Not really something important, I would say, for a Christian. But uh, connections. You have to go out and make friends of the right people. Do a good job with your business and whatever else so that you can have good connections. Technology, you have to learn that. Technology takes some time. My wife right now is building her computer. That takes some time. She has to go in and watch tutorials and okay, yeah, this goes here and this cable goes there and oh, I don't know if this cable is going to fit over there and that thing. And she's going to learn a whole new operating system. There's times I get stuff and I, you know, get a camera and I think, okay, I have to figure out how this thing works. What does this button do? Oh, great. Now, how do I get back to the other menu? I could push this. Or... I have to learn that stuff. I mean, you should have seen some of my early video productions. They were terrible. My very first DVD I brought out, it was awful. What did I have to do? I had to learn more technology. Why? So my videos could be more effective. You have to study. And if you think that you get this one down here, spiritual power, without having to work for it, you're insane. God's just going to protect me because I'm one of His. And so I can live however I want to live, and I can do whatever I want to do, and I'll have all the spiritual power that there is. That's not true. That's not true. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Let's go over there. Second Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For, you get spiritual gifts when you get saved, in other words. Paul's specifically writing to Timothy, but the whole point is even if you had no you know, Christian men putting their hand upon you and praying for you when you get saved, you still get some gifts from the Holy Spirit uh, when you get saved, when you're truly born again. Verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. What are we talking about? Power. And of love and of a sound mind. Um, I had a long time ago, many years ago, I did a, a sermon, Logic versus Emotion. I think it was 2013 or something. And uh, actually it was inspired by a guy from India one of our viewers at the time, and he said, I've never met anybody or listened to anybody that was so logical in his argumentation. I'd love to hear you do a talk about logic. And that was a really, you know, an honorable thing. It really it was a great blessing to hear that. And I've always tried to be logical. Um, I, of course, people don't agree with my, you know, conclusions I come to and whatever else. So they say, Dunlinger's not logical and whatever. <laughs> okay, whatever. You're free to believe whatever you want. But, um, there are certain things that are just not logical to me, and I'll take a stand against those things. Why? Well, because I have a sound mind. I know that this book is true. I don't have any question in my mind. You say, well, they just found an older and better manuscript than both Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. They found something from the first century, and it proves that the King James Bible is false. Go fly a kite, man. Shut up. I don't want to talk to you. 
you say you would reject something like they can fake any evidence and whatever else. I mean, I think the last years, uh, two years should have taught us that the evidence can be faked. <laughs> um, they can do anything like that. You know, oh, we found this ancient manuscript. We found this thing. It actually has Paul's signature on it. The Apostle Paul actually signed his name. We found an original autograph and it's not doesn't match the King James Bible uh, or something. Whatever. <laughs> I don't care. You know why? Because I've lived this book. I've had so much experience with this book. I've applied it to my life. I've tried to live what the book actually says and love the commandments of God. Why? Because I wanted to have spiritual power. And I realize if I give up certain things, if I can bring my thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ, if I'm constantly just ruffling myself and saying, uh, okay, stop thinking that. Don't say that. Don't, don't believe this way. All right, so, sorry, Lord, help me to get a better song in my mind. I just do that stuff all the time. Praying without ceasing. That's the kind of stuff I'm interested in. I want to have spiritual power. And I've seen spiritual power come from this book right here. It doesn't come from the new versions. I tried those. Mm -mm. <laughs> You're not going to get me back to the new versions. I don't care what little uh, findings you have or little attacks on the King James Bible or whatever else. Well, this verse here is improperly quoted. Well, this one here doesn't line up with the best Greek. To... <laughs> go away. Go away. I've seen spiritual power. I've had dealings with the, the spiritual realm, with devils and things, and this is the book that I fight with. It is not... A new version or you know the Nestle's text or something or you know yeah uh, spiritual power brethren um, there's some bad times coming as I've been saying for a while as the Bible says there's some really bad times coming what kind of power are you having to look forward to you say well brother I have a 401k I have a big pension coming I've made all the rest, right investments. <sighs> yeah. I have uh, invested in Bitcoin. I have a lot of financial security for the future. It could all get wiped out. It's wiped out before in the first Great Depression. All the people with their stock market investments and everything else got wiped out. Fighting strength. I can bench press, you know, 200 pounds or whatever somebody would say. Um... I can jog, you know, five miles without getting out of breath. I have all this stuff. I've been, th I have a black belt in karate and a black belt in taekwondo, and I can do all these other things in judo, wrestling, and I'm a MMA, you know, guy and whatever. Some guy shoots you. What does it mean? <laughs> Doesn't mean anything. Um, some bunch of rioters and whatever food riots coming in the future because of the famine, and, and some guy pops you and whatever. Well, you're dead. Um, why well, I have a, you know, I have an AR-15, you know, 30 round magazine or something, you know, large capacity extra. I have a, you know, 100 round drum magazine. Okay. Some dork with a high point nine millimeter can pop you from behind or whatever else. You're dead. Why well, I have a 50 caliber, right? doesn't matter. <laughs> somebody can nail you. You'd be crossing the road. Somebody run you down with their car. Somebody throw a brick at you, you know? You have a jam with your gun, you're trying to shoot, and something jams, and you're trying to get the thing. Some guy come walking up behind you and say, oh, here's an old hammer, and take him. <clears throat> you're dead. I knew of an older woman the one time, was in, she was a welfare caseworker, walking down the road. Some guy came up, grabbed a lead pipe, and went bonk over the back of her head, took her purse, and ran. She was in the hospital for a while with a concussion. Lead pipe. Fighting strength? <laughs> How about wisdom? I have a PhD and a THD and a THM and an honorary doctorate and, and a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. And, a, you know. and what does that mean? Hopefully it'll help you to have enough sense to prepare for things that are coming and to consider what the Bible says and, and things. You know, Hopefully you have some fear of God. That's the beginning of wisdom. You say, well, I'm an atheist. Well, then you're not really wise. Physical attraction. Well, I'm a real good-looking guy, very, you know, wonderful. I don't have a big beard like this, you know, so nice. I have an Armani suit, and I'll walk down the street, and everybody will just think I'm wonderful as the world's falling apart. Oh, don't touch me. I'm attractive. 
you know. <laughs> uh, here's some woman. Oh, I'm very, I'm very pretty, and I have all the right clothing and all the right everything just matches, and oh, it just my, all my outfits coordinate, you know, and I have matching shoes for each one of the outfits that I have or something. Uh, I think my grandmother, um, on my mother's side, my maternal grandmother, uh, she had something like seventy some pairs of shoes. <laughs> Not joking, um, yeah. Um, what does that mean? Is that real power? Not really. Connections. Well, the boys down at the lodge are telling me the inside secrets to what's coming and what's going on. And I have those connections and things. Are you going to be protected? Guaranteed protection? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> oh wait, food rights. Hold on. China's attacking Taiwan. Wait a second. I'm Phi Beta Kappa. You know, try Delta. Hey, don't you, don't touch me. I'm an entered apprentice, Freemason. I am a master mason. What does that mean? Look, I have a ring. <laughs> My secret fraternal, you know, thing here. Let's do a handshake, you know, and whatever. Yeah. Technology. Uh, I can hack into the right systems and I'll get out of the bad times that are coming and I can I have a smartphone I'll be safe because I can go and I can look up things as I'm running and can be tracked as well <laughs> whatever so where's your uh, power in the future where's it come from spiritual and that's basically it uh, that's all that we really have, brethren. And this one here, like I said, undoes all of this stuff right here. If you're walking close to the Lord and you're right with God, you don't have to worry about a whole lot. The Lord will lead you through. He'll, you, as a Christian, uh, you don't believe in, in uh, coincidence. Everything is part of God's plan in your life. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Romans 8.28 We know. We know that. That's where you want to be in the future. You say, well, I'm going to try a different... I agree with you that the spiritual is there, but I just I reject Christianity. I'm going to look for some other path. Okay, go ahead. Um, I'm, a, I'm a northern heathen pagan. I'm going to go with Odin. Oh, oh, the guy that slinks around just kind of, you know, walks around with his little ravens following him and just kind of hides from people and things. Well, that guy... Good luck with that one. Or hey, you know, maybe you could try Islam. You know, Muhammad, the uh, pervert and whatever else. And the, the, oh, I'm going to come around after Jesus Christ, you know, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to pretend that I'm the final prophet, you know, and whatever else and all this stuff. Uh, yeah. How's that going to work? Uh, not very good. Um, no, you need to get saved. You need to be born again. Um, don't go with your organized religions and whatever else. That stuff will not get you anywhere. Um, you need to have spiritual power, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you need to have a connection to this Holy Bible right here, King James Bible. That's what you need. Somebody comes along and says, well, but which edition? What this? What that? You know, Go away. Uh, you're just trying to cast out on the Word of God. Um, I mean, hey, you want a logical, rational experiment? Get a King James Bible, read it, believe it, and say, I'm going to put this book into practice. If this book says, don't do this, thou shalt not, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to rightly divide it, so I'm not going back to the Old Testament and saying, well, there's Levitical laws back here, but the New Testament says, well, the New Testament is there to say, okay, what was done there in the Old Testament in terms of the Levitical laws and things, that has been done away with for you as a Gentile Christian today. Rightly divide the scriptures. You see? You don't have to have the thing of clean and unclean meats. That was done away in the New Testament. So again, you know, study this stuff. There's no contradictions in the Word of God unless you're non-dispensational. Then there's a lot of contradictions. But live by this book. And you'll see that your life will prosper. And you will have spiritual power. I can tell you, I've experienced it, I've lived it. And you get to that level where you say, I've seen this book work in my life. Nobody's going to take this book from me. So that's going to be it for this study.
just something I've been thinking about as we go into these very uncertain times, a little word of exhortation for you out there. Um, if you're saved and you are living right, you're you know, bringing every thought into you know, captivity to the obedience of Christ, you're going to have that spiritual power there. That's going to get you through whatever happens. Uh, your town, city, home, wherever, your area, could be attacked by foreign troops, and God can get you through it. Uh, your entire bank account can get wiped out. God can get you through it if you have that spiritual power. You know, all this different stuff. Like I said, money gets wiped out. God will get you through. Fighting strength. You're over, there's more power out there, more people than you can handle that are trying to kill you. God can get you through it. Wisdom. There's a bunch of people that are a lot wiser than you that are trying to destroy you. God can protect you. Physical attraction. Again, <clears throat> be bad people and things that, that are a lot more attractive to the lost world and they're trying to bring you down. God can protect you. People with connections, Masonic connections, and scheming behind the scenes at your bank and whatever and doing things to try to mess with you. If you have spiritual power, God can get you through it. And technology. I'm still on YouTube. I mean, after all these years, since 2008, you know, that's a long time to be around. What, 14 years, I guess. Um, that's a lot of time to be here. And I'm still here. I didn't think I'd make it this long. But God has a purpose for this channel. God has a purpose... For me being here, being able to preach to you. So, <clears throat> there's spiritual power there. And that's what you want. So, that is going to be it for this study. Thank you very much for watching. Um, and, uh, you know, something that has really been revealed to me lately, because I'm very much um, the biggest, the, my worst critic is myself. I attack myself quite a bit and just say, oh, you're doing this wrong, and what are you doing wrong, and what could you improve in, and, and whatever else. I'm very critical um, of my work that I put out, and I've always known the importance of prayer, obviously, but I tend to think, okay, I'm wanting to see God's judgment in this world, and I want to see justice for a lot of the evils that are being done, and I'm thinking, okay, how do I you know, have God's judgment happen if it's something that's prophesied? Can I hinder that? Is there, are there other things that are not prophesied and I can fight against that? I have a video I did on Rumble. It's not here on YouTube because I had to talk about the pandemic thing and, you know, YouTube doesn't like that, whatever. But, you know, I'm starting to realize it's not necessarily, well, I have to preach so, certain things and I have to do certain things to get God to, act and whatever else you know to show god that i'm serious about this and whatever i just need to talk to the lord and i've been really focusing more on my prayer life and all of us you know myself my wife and even my son we've been doing a lot more praying um a lot more and you know we're cleaning up our lives the sanctification process to increase our spiritual strength um but just the thing of praying and we're trying a lot more to pray. And um, so I just want to encourage you out there, please pray very hard. It's not just some kind of a thing of, well, you know, I got 30 seconds here quick. I can pray really fast. And then spend some real time in prayer. Um, it doesn't cost you anything but your time. Right? And it's extremely important. Um, and just pray. And, and Lord, you know, start out with giving him thanks about things. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the food that I have that I ate. And thank you for all that you've done for me. Thank you for saving me. And then go into your requests. Make your requests be known. You know, the Bible talks about prayer and thanksgiving. Um, let your requests be known to him. And pray according to his word and say, Lord, your word says such and such. And the people out there are not doing this. And they have no desire for repentance. Um, Lord, please stop this. This nation's gone far enough. I think that's something we should start praying. We need to see God's judgment on America. The people are just, they've hardened their hearts. They don't care about the gospel. Um, by and large, most people, they've heard the gospel, seen the gospel so many times, they're just saying, don't want anything to do with it. And it's going to take an intense amount of suffering for people to understand, hey, you know what, maybe I should get saved. Um, as time goes by, we're seeing less opportunities for people to truly get born again. 
And that's why we need to see God's judgment, because that will bring them back in line. So uh, we will see you in the next study. And uh, I guess that's going to be it. So thank you very much for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.